This is Inside Healthcare, brought to you by On Location TV 19 and St. John's Hospital in Maplewood. St. John's is your community resource, committed to providing quality care at every stage of life, and is a member of the Health East Care System. Now here is your host, Jody Ritaka. Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Did you know that the number one cause of death among women is heart disease, just as it is for men? And women at any age can have heart disease or a heart attack. Do you know what you can do to protect yourself? For some answers, we talked and went on location and talked with some leading heart specialists. And here's what they had to say. We're coming to you from St. Joseph's Hospital in downtown St. Paul from the beautiful new Healthiest Heart Care, which is bringing together cardiologists, heart surgeons, and a wide range of other cardiac professionals to provide leading edge care by the most advanced teams in the region. So joining us now is Dr. Patrick Kohler, interventional cardiologist. And um, doctor, perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an interventional cardiologist here in St. Paul, and uh, I specialize in the area of uh, corneal angiography, which is the test we do to look at somebody's blood vessels to, his, to their hearts. And um, our interest is in identifying if people have blockages that have built up and obstruct the blood flow, and then go in there and try to relieve that obstruction, opening with a balloon and sometimes putting a metal tube in called a stent. Um, and that's the bulk of what we do. And uh, often it's for people who have chest pains, which call angina. Uh, but many times it's for people who are actively having a heart attack, and that's why they come to the hospital. And uh, usually a heart attack is from a blood vessel that is suddenly clotted off and the blood flow can't get through the obstruction. So we bring them actually right up here and on this table in this cath lab. And we uh, identify where the blockage is and we go in and open up the artery and restore the blood flow and that usually stops the process. Are there some new technologies or new mm -hmm. tests that we're doing currently? Yeah, the area is always kind of advancing. Uh, the, uh, uh, technology has gotten simpler and easier. The type of stents we use, those metal tubes, are, are much easier to deploy. They're, they're mounted better on balloons and easier to get into these lesions. Um, we have newer imaging uh, techniques. We can actually go inside the artery and see the artery from the inside, sometimes with an ultrasound, and identify the lesion, the plaque, measure the artery, and be a lot more precise on how we treat them. And so that's actually uh, enhanced our ability to make the correct diagnosis and treatment. And I understand the patients are awake during the procedure. Pretty much so. We do give them some sedation because understandably it's sort of an anxiety provoking situation. It's right. the heart, you know, and that's understandable. But uh, we don't have to put them to sleep. Um, and um, fortunately, um, other than when we put the IVs in initially, the aorta which is where we move the catheters up, and the heart don't have pain fibers inside, so you actually can't even feel that we're in there. And uh, so that makes it a lot more comfortable for them. Yeah, I think I've heard from patients that it's that site of where the, mm -hmm. the catheter goes in, or the tube yeah. goes in, that causes them more problems afterwards, or discomfort. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that is, and actually even that is uh, evolving. We're beginning to do this procedure through the radial artery, which is uh, right, you know, here in the wrist. And so it's, it's a little bit easier sometimes for the patients. Uh, they don't have to lay flat as long. It's not, they don't have the limitations with walking afterwards. And uh, so again, another advance that uh, has helped the procedure. And this pertains to women as well as men. It, it's a growing problem with women. It certainly does. And um, it's important uh, uh, they can have uh, you know the same degree, same problems that men do. Sometimes it presents a little bit differently in women, and so physicians need to be uh, alert and thinking about that all the time. And uh, but you still want to be as aggressive in, in treating it the same way. What would be those war warning signs, and how would they differ mm -hmm. for women versus men? Well, a typical symptom we think about is sort of a dull pressure or discomfort in the chest, and uh, it's not necessarily a real sharp or intense pain, as sometimes you'll see it portrayed on television, although it can be. Sometimes it's just kind of an odd feeling in the chest or like an indigestion, and uh, uh, it just seems like it's noticeably something that's different. Some people actually don't have chest pain. Sometimes it's uh, an ache in the shoulder or a numbness going down the arm or sometimes a jaw or neck discomfort. 
And so you can have a lot of variable manifestations, and sometimes in women it, that's how it will present. And uh, it can easily be misinterpreted as a shoulder problem, particularly if they have an ongoing shoulder problem like a bursitis uh, or maybe a dental problem because it's their jaw, and they do have ongoing uh, dental problems. But uh, it's something to always kind of keep in the back of your mind and think through. So if you have any of these symptoms, call 911. I think it, certainly if they're ongoing and they're not relieved and they're persistent, I think that would be an important thing to do. Because one of the problems with the heart is that uh, an ongoing injury to the heart can cause the heart to suddenly uh, beat erratically and have an abnormal rhythm that can lead to a sudden cardiac arrest. And uh, we usually advise patients that uh, if they're having these symptoms and, uh, and they're persistent, that they should think about calling an ambulance and have them come take them to the hospital. Don't, Try to get in the car and drive yourself. If something happens and you're on the road, uh, just have an ambulance come. Have the, the experts uh, take you there and monitor you and give you treatment that is necessary. One of the really important advantages is, is that they can come out and they can do an EKG right in your home and identify that you're having maybe a heart attack. If that's the case, we have a program here at St. Joseph's Hospital that they would contact us directly that they think they have a heart attack. And instead of going to the emergency room, we actually bring them right here into the cath lab directly, and we uh, do the procedure and find out if that's in fact the case. It sometimes saves up to 45 minutes, an hour, even longer in, in evaluation, and we know that once an artery closes, that shortly after that, permanent injury begins to occur to the heart muscle. And the faster you get that artery open, the less amount of injury that they'll have. And so we uh, try to expedite that by training our EMS people in St. Paul to identify this, do the EKG, bring them right here to the cath lab where we can work right away. And it's amazing sometimes what kind of rapid recovery people will have. Wow, that's amazing. Final mm -hmm. advice for our viewers out there? Well, be aware of your risk factors. That's the most important. Uh, find your cholesterol, know what it is, and talk to your physicians about that and what the correct treatment is. Uh, monitor your blood pressure. Know if you have hypertension, get the correct treatment. Uh, uh, find out if you have diabetes. Uh, look to your family tree. Do these problems run in your family? Does your family members have heart attacks if they had cholesterol diabetic problems? And talk to your physicians about that and these things can be screened and looked at. Treating risk factors can definitely reduce your risk of having these kind of problems like heart attack. Joining us now is Dr. Michael Garr. Nice to meet you well, and nice to glad you. to have you on the show with us. So maybe you can start off first of all telling us um, a little bit about yourself and, and what do you do? I'm Michael Garr. I've been practicing in St. Paul uh, cardiology for the last 15 years, and I, my interests are in non-invasive cardiology, so office-based practice, stress testing, uh, new modalities like CT scan, heart failure, and uh, people uh, interest in people with uh, congenital heart disease or, or birth defects. So um, we, you said stress tests, but also CT scans. It's a new way of checking for problems with the heart. Yeah, this is this is an exciting new area because it's something that we're going to be bringing uh, new to Health East Hospital, and, and and what it involves is uh, being able to look directly at the blood vessels of the heart using a CT scan, which is a non-invasive way of lighting up the blood vessels of the heart and injecting dye uh, through a vein in your arm rather than threading the tube up into your groin and up into your heart. So a non-invasive way of studying what the blood vessels of the heart look like. And it's really added a, a new dimension to our ability to, to diagnose and, and treat and understand coronary disease. So is it almost like looking through a window right at the heart muscle itself? Yeah, it is. You get beautiful pictures, uh, 3D uh, construct, reconstruction pictures uh, that allows us not only to look at the blood vessels of the heart, but the shape of the heart, the size of the heart, but, but really for the first time uh, able to define the uh, the, the blood vessels of the heart uh, uh, in a way that we just couldn't do a number of years ago. So what are the types of things that you're looking for when you're looking at these scans or even at a stress test? So with stress tests, we're, we're either walking somebody on the treadmill or using a chemical to sort of stress the heart, looking to see if there's a, a problem with how the blood is getting to the heart. And uh, people typically present with chest pain or shortness of breath. And if the stress test is abnormal, that suggests to us that there may be something going on with the blood flow to the heart. The CT scan uh, is another dimension that allows us to ask that question uh, more directly by looking directly at the blood vessels of the heart. And, 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 uh, and, and again, allows us to decide whether there's enough blockage or significant blockage that, that warrants more invasive investigation and treatment or not.
And if there is this blockage, that stops the blood flow to the heart muscle itself. Yeah, depending on the uh, degree of blockage, it can it can cause chest pain or shortness of breath because when when you try to uh, exercise or walk or do something physical, if there's diminished blood flow to the heart, you're not going to be able to do those activities and, and you get those symptoms. And, and, and that's the, the typical presentation for people with heart disease. And you had mentioned heart failure. What does that look like to a, a patient? Is that shortness of breath? Or is there swelling? What, what would be the signs and symptoms? Yeah, good question. It presents in a number of ways, but primarily shortness of breath. So people present with uh, difficulty breathing, oftentimes with uh, swelling of their legs. Uh, with their breathing, it's oftentimes people that are having more difficulty lying flat because they're short of breath and find themselves having to prop themselves up in, in, in the bed in order to, to feel uh, like they're uh, having, uh, getting enough air to breathe. Are there certain people that are more apt or at a higher risk for heart failure? There are. There are people that have had prior heart attacks or people with coronary artery disease or, or blocked blood vessels, but also people with long-standing high blood pressure that is about untreated. And there are certain viral illnesses that can cause uh, heart dysfunction uh, without uh, any predisposing factors. So when should someone come see you then? They should come if they have concerns about uh, diminished exercise tolerance, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, dizziness. Those are the symptoms that, that, that warrant investigation from, from, a, from a heart standpoint. And that, that's what we do and, and, and that's what we see every day. It seems like now we even have more and better treatments for heart failure, helping people live longer. Absolutely. We have uh, uh, medication treatments that have been tried and true in a long, uh, and around for a long time. And, and every day we see people who have had dramatic improvements, not only in their symptoms, but improvement in their heart function with, with the appropriate medication treatment. And, and uh, oftentimes, uh, depending on the situation, we have mechanical uh, devices like pacemakers and, and, and other devices that, that can enhance the treatment of heart failure in, in, in certain individuals. What final advice would you have for our viewers? Well, to stay heart healthy. It's important to, to, to follow a, a, a prudent diet, which includes keeping salt down in your diet, especially people with high blood pressure or as we get older, because that, that is one way that you can uh, develop uh, symptoms of shortness of breath and heart failure. And, and making sure that you monitor your blood pressure and have your cholesterol checked and follow up with your physician and, and, and heed their advice if, if, if it is indeed important to come visit with a cardiologist. Joining us now is Dr. David Dunbar. Thank you, doctor, for being with us. Thank you. Maybe you can tell exciting. us, our, tell our viewers what it is exactly that you do and just a little bit about yourself. I'm an electrophysiologist here with Health East Heart Care and our job is to uh, treat patients who have cardiac arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms, fainting, uh, to see if we can relieve both the symptoms and to prevent some of the consequences of those arrhythmias like cardiac arrest. What would be some of those treatments? We have some exciting new treatments that we're doing to help these patients. Yeah, well there's a variety of different treatments. Patients with slow heart rhythms often would receive a permanent pacemaker. Uh, it's a device that's implanted here under the collarbone with lead wires that go down into the heart and that uh, device delivers an electric charge to the heart to make sure that the heart rate never decreases below a certain point. Uh, patients who have abnormally fast heart rhythms are either treated with a procedure called ablation to identify the site or the spot inside the heart where those fast heart rhythms are coming from and then to either freeze or burn a piece of tissue responsible for those fast heart rhythms or sometimes in, if patients have dangerously fast heart rhythms that can lead to cardiac arrest we'll put in an implantable defibrillator that's a device that uh, could shock the heart back to normal rhythm if they ever develop these dangerous heart rhythms uh, outside the hospital. And without treatment, that could cause more serious problems? Well, it is actually the most common cause for sudden cardiac death or sudden death. Uh, if patients experience that, unless the paramedics can reach them quite promptly and deliver an electric shock to get them back to normal rhythm, those patients often die before they reach the hospital. 
this would be something where those um, external defibrillators come in handy what they have now at different public facilities yes. and things like yeah, that? Yeah, those are automatic external defibrillators. So uh, if a patient has a cardiac arrest, for instance, in a hockey arena and they have an AED in that arena, uh, non-skilled personnel can apply that and it would automatically recognize that this is a cardiac arrest and deliver the electric shock. The beauty of an implantable defibrillator is that's implanted all the time and monitoring the patient all the time, day or night. If this patient then experiences a cardiac arrest, within about 15 seconds this device will deliver the life-saving shock rather than uh, waiting uh, for a response time from the paramedics. Um, so it, it's a major advance in terms of preventing sudden death, which causes approximately half of all cardiac deaths. Mm -hmm. Patients who may need, benefit from the implantable defibrillator usually have severely damaged heart muscles, either from past heart attack or weakness of the heart muscle called cardiomyopathy. Those patients often have fluid buildup, what we call congestive heart failure, and those are the patients who are most at risk for cardiac arrest. And in years past, uh, over five years ago, we would wait until the patient experienced their first collapse, and then if they were resuscitated and survived that, we would put in the implantable defibrillator to uh, make sure that this would never happen again. Now we can identify uh, patients who've had cardiac or, or who are at risk for cardiac arrest but who have never had a cardiac arrest and we'll implant those defibrillators before their first cardiac arrest and uh, survival has improved uh, quite dramatically with that. Wow, that's amazing how far we've come in a very short time and how that's helping to save lives here. Um, when you were talking about the ablation, can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about those procedures? Yeah, ablation is a way to damage um, basically the the focus or the source of abnormal heart rhythms. Typically, these are fast rhythms rather than slow rhythms, and there's a number of different rhythms that we target with ablation. SVT is rapid heart rhythms from the top chambers of the heart. Those are typically non-life threatening, but often patients will need to either take daily medicines or go to the emergency room to get IV medicines in order to get those fast rhythms back to normal. Uh, typically with those ablations, we uh, put in tubes or catheters in the heart. We can pace the heart in a certain way to cause those abnormal heart rhythms. Once we cause the abnormal heart rhythms, we move catheters around inside the heart and we can identify the spot inside the heart where these abnormal heart rhythms come from. Once we identify that spot, we either freeze that tissue with a catheter, on the tip of a catheter or sometimes we'll heat up the tip of the catheter and burn those muscle fibers responsible for that abnormal circuit. After we do that procedure, we try again to reinduce or start up the abnormal heart rhythm. If we can't start it up, chances are this rhythm, our abnormal heart rhythm is gone permanently and will never wow. recur. Wow, that is amazing. What would be some of the other treatments that are available for patients that may have electrical problems with their heart? Um, well, uh, with respect to congestive heart failure, there's been a new development uh, probably again within the last four or five years. It's called CRT therapy. CRT therapy involves either putting in a pacemaker or an implantable defibrillator, but instead of using one or two wires, we add a third lead wire to the heart uh, called a left ventricular lead. Uh, with congestive heart failure, at times there's what's called dyssynchrony. Dysynch when uh, the heart muscle is weakened, sometimes some walls move in before others, so the contraction isn't coordinated. We call that dyssynchrony. By pacing from the left side of the heart, we can get those heart muscle walls to move together again. And that can dramatically decrease the symptoms of congestive heart failure, fluid buildup, it improves exercise tolerance, and uh, 
uh, patients uh, survive longer because we've improved heart pumping function. Often this is done in concert with the implantable defibrillator, uh, but sometimes we'll uh, use CRT therapy with pacemaker alone. Are there certain um, groups of population that are more at risk for these type of conditions to develop, or can it happen at any age? Um, arrhythmias can happen at any age. Um, so many of our patients, for instance, with have SVT can be quite young. Teenagers or even children have SVT. Patients who need implantable defibrillators are typically uh, much older. Often they've had prior heart attack or myocardial infarction where part of the heart muscle dies because it doesn't get enough blood supply. And there's uh, various uh, diseases that can cause weakening of the heart muscle, such as leaky heart valves or high blood pressure over the years that can weaken the heart, predispose those patients to abnormal heart rhythms, and um, possibly cardiac arrest. Uh, there's another arrhythmia that's very, very common in the older population called atrial fibrillation. That's where the top part of the heart beats more rapidly and, and the pulse is irregular and often faster than normal. This causes a lot of symptoms. Um, uh, approximately 10% of uh, patients age 70 or over will have atrial fibrillation. Uh, one of the, the concerns with atrial fibrillation is the risk of stroke. So many of these patients will be on what we call blood thinners or anticoagulants to prevent blood clots from forming in the heart. But also now we can use ablation techniques to uh, diminish the likelihood of recurrent atrial fibrillation if medications don't work. Final advice for our viewers that would, might be watching? Um, uh, with respect to cardiac arrest, uh, there's a campaign that, that's out there called Know Your EF. EF is ejection fraction, and if you've had serious heart disease and the ejection fraction is less than 35 percent, then you may be at potential risk for cardiac arrest, and you should uh, contact your doctor. Um, uh, there's a world of therapies out there for patients with cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, therapies are improving every day, and uh, we can do much, much more now than we could when we started, when I started practice 20 years ago. So it's a, a great place to practice and a great time to practice EP. All right. Thank you, Dr. David Dunbar, for being with us. Appreciate it. Coming up next on Inside Healthcare, tips for you on how to eat heart healthy. It's easier than you think. Healthcare here in the studio. We're talking about what you can do to protect yourself against heart disease, the number one killer of women and men. The American Heart Association says it's important to know your risk factors, exercise regularly, and learn more about heart healthy eating. And to help us give us some advice on how we go about doing that, we're pleased to have with us Sarah Bernstein. She's a fitness and nutrition specialist from Woodwinds Ways to Wellness. Thanks, Sarah, for taking time to be with us. Thanks for having me. So what, what would be those top three things on heart-healthy eating? What exactly is that? So the top three things, it's actually much easier than you think, and it should be how everybody eats. A healthy diet, especially from the Heart Association recommendations, are how everyone should eat. The top three things would be fruits and vegetables, and how often have we heard that? But really, we're, we're eating less and less, and that's where we're getting all our antioxidants that protect ourselves from damage that's occurring every day, kind of like the rusty nail. So we mm -hmm. need to eat our fruits and vegetables. The number two thing would be limiting our saturated fat, and that has creeped up, and our total fat has creeped up, but the type of fat that we're eating has creeped up quite a bit as well. We're eating more red meat, which has a lot of saturated fat and cholesterol. We're not eating as many plant-based foods like fatty fish or nuts and seeds. And the third thing would, would just be to look at your fiber. We're eating, you know, carbohydrates aren't bad. We're just eating the wrong types of carbohydrates, white, fluffy carbohydrates that don't give us a lot. You know, sometimes it's deceiving, too, when you look at a, a loaf of bread or a product and it says it's um, healthy for you, but you have to look at those 
first ingredients to say if it has whole grains in it or Absolutely. whole wheat or there's lots of information on whole grain and multi-grain and cracked wheat what we really need to look for are two things we need to flip that package over look at the ingredient list for fiber you want to have at least three grams of fiber and the other healthy tip that you can look for on the label is the American Heart Association has a check mark on the outside and that check mark is um, certified in how much saturated fat total fat trans fat and how much fiber is in that product and how do you know that I mean how do you know which one is the best one for you again? Yeah, so all fiber is good, but the one we're looking for is soluble fiber, and that one has um, a heart helper that helps lower your LDL. Soluble fibers in oat bran, oatmeal, and fruits and vegetables as well. What about if you tend to go out to eat a lot, like a lot of people do at restaurants and especially fast food restaurants? Yeah. How do you make sure you're having a heart healthy diet then? There are lots of good choices, and I tell a lot of my clients in Ways to Wellness when they're eating out, think of how they can get some vegetables in that entree. Order an extra side of vegetables, look for the lean meats and the, and the brown rice that they have it. More and more restaurants are having those healthy options available. Salads can be good. The type of oil, however, on the salad dressing may be filled with omega-6 fatty acids. We're trying to get more of the omega-3 from the fish oils and also canola oil. So canola oil-based salad dressing would be great to do. And maybe have that dressing on the side too. Absolutely. If you like salad, eat everything goes on the side. <laughs> what other tips would you say? Um, it's not only what you eat, but also where you store your fat as well that's important. Yeah, instead of jumping on that scale and just looking at the number, if your BMI is high, it really matters where you carry your weight. So we do a waist to hip measurement. Um, we measure just in inches around your abdomen, right by your belly button, and then around your hips. Um, a ratio of uh, 0.80 or lower for women and a 0.90 or lower for men. And what does is that considered mean? Considered heart exactly? healthy. The ratio of inches uh, divided waist divided by your hips. The more abdominal weight you carry, that signifies more visceral fat stores around your heart, and that's the dangerous type of fat. Not so much what we carry, maybe in our cellulite in our legs or in our arms. That's not the risk factor. It's really the abdominal weight. So the same kind of fat that you might have around the middle is also surrounding that heart and the other organs. Exactly. So when you have um, you have a, n a number of clients that you help with weight management and things like that, what advice do you give to them on heart healthy diets? Yeah, the biggest piece I can take away is it's really not that difficult to do. Um, plan your diet around your vegetable first. We always plan it around the meat, so plan it around the vegetables first, and then add some healthy grains in there that have some fiber, whole wheat, brown pasta. Um, and then add your meat as kind of the accent piece and if we can eat more fish and the biggest thing I tell people is move get moving somehow because exercise as a personal trainer and waste wellness we've got to move to keep that heart healthy as a pump as well and you've actually had clients that have seen results right that have turn their life around by losing weight, getting more active. Absolutely. By, by making small little changes to their diet, maybe eating a, one more serving of vegetables or changing that brown rice or white rice to brown rice, they've seen drops in their cholesterol level by 10 points, by more. Wow. And so really small changes add up in the long run to big results. What final advice would you have for our, our viewers listening? The final advice would be exercise, get those vegetables in, and it's not that hard to get small steps, and you'll, you'll see the results you want. And it's really important to know your numbers, and um, there's going to be a number of free screenings, heart screenings, throughout the month of February. And as you can see on the screen there, for the dates, times, and locations, go to healtheast.org and you can find out all about that. And um, Sarah, will you be at some of these health, health screenings? Yes, someone well? from our Ways to Wellness program will be, will be at the Mall of America coming up at the heart screening, so check us out. All right, well, thank you. Great advice, as thank always. You. Appreciate you having, having you with us. So thanks. thanks, Sarah, and we'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then. For more information, visit St. John's Hospital mn.org or call 651-326-7800.